Hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 12-game main slate that we have on Friday, uh, May 19. Um, a few arms on the mound up top that we probably are going to want to get to. And I think some good tournament pivots, maybe in the mid-range at some low ownership, I think we could consider as well. But um, in my first initial kind of look here of the slate i think you might see some offense here we got some attackable spots uh pretty popular one of course coming down here with houston against ken waldachuk who has been uh terrible um bunch of other spots you've got a another major league debut down here in colorado with carl kaufman um Against Texas, not great there. You got a couple young arms, Bryce Elder, Bryce Miller, uh, facing off in Atlanta. And another young arm, Jake Irvin over here against Detroit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Paxton uh, making his second start in a pretty bad matchup against the Padres tonight. Um, Dodgers get Steven Matz, you know, like the, the Cardinals put up 15 runs again last night. Um very hot offense over here. So I think we might be able to see some offense uh, in a lot of games here tonight, um, perhaps more so than, than other 12 gamers where we're generally pretty balanced, got a good mix of, of arms, but uh, I'm not sure that is really the case here today. Um, now, projection-wise, we don't have anybody just like leading the way where they're well north of 20. Everybody's just kind of spread out here in the mid-range, anywhere from 15 to 18 points, and that usually means that we should see some ownership pretty spread out. Um, now, we've got some models still around the industry uh, waiting to wake up, as it were, um, so we'll have updates later, but projections will be uh, loaded to the site um, after for your perusal whenever um, you get the earliest chance, of course. So keep an eye out for changes in, the, in these figures because as these projections are mostly flat, um, I think that makes for some attackable pivots, uh, notably off of like Blake Snell here, who's 30% owned for some stupid reason. Um, I get to fade him again today, so that's cool. So I think we can make some pivots here in, in tournaments and get off of some of this mega chalky ownership with super high variance pitchers like a Blake Snell. Um, so 12 games, let's just get into it here and start with uh, Chicago and Philly. We have Stroman on the mound uh, for the Cubs. Not sure if he's going to be one of the guys that we're going to pivot off of Snell to, however. Uh, now price-wise, yeah, that works, at least on DK at 8,800 here. Um, he's you know sub-5% owned. And projection, really not high enough. If you're just building teams that you'll end up landing on this, um, you'd have to probably X Snell and then and then see what happens. But uh, this is a pretty bad matchup. K stuff for Strowman is, is started to tail off, as we've talked about a little bit. He's regressing back to his normal sort of Strowman ways. Um, but still getting good value out of everything here in the arsenal here. He's got a full nine starts now and, and 50 innings with 200 hitters. So we can start to use some of the value metrics and everything's been pretty good and plus for the most for the most part still getting a lot of ground balls here even uh like way more so than his career averages so staying way down with the sinker cutter slider um throwing this cutter in on the hands to lefties neutralizing a lot of the power here to the left side of the plate with the buck 10 iso strikeout stuff not really there for them or for him against left-handers that is uh, at just 18% so far in this 100-hitter sample. Um, not a lot of hard contact necessarily, but also not really inducing a lot of soft. So mostly just medium and a boatload of ground balls here. So 330 ground ball to fly ball is an elite figure, of course. So having a little bit of trouble spotting it and, and walking some lefties, but to control, 58% um, strike one rate is not horrible for Stroman. It's kind of... Uh, in his career average range, I would say. Um, really, the only issue we have when playing Strowman, as always, it is upside in tournaments and being able to survive deep enough into a game to realize 
uh, you know, a, a below average strikeout rate. We usually want him against very right-handed heavy teams um, because he's got this sinker slider combination. And that really doesn't change this year. Full 29% K rate to uh, the right side of the plate with a 19% soft contact rate. So very strong there. Obviously, the ground balls are still there. Expected metrics, 275 XBA, 330 X Woba, and a 121 X ISO. These are all fantastic, right? Aggregate, 23% K rate. This is a bad matchup, though. And, of course, Philly has gotten their best left-handed hitter healthy again in Bryce Harper. So, um... I don't really want to stack against Stroman here, but that doesn't really mean I want to play him. The numbers for the Phillies are going to con continue to drift up. 108 WRC plus so far um, in their 1,100 PAs. And with Harper back, these are these numbers are going to continue to climb, uh, even against you know a pretty respectable arm in Marcus Stroman over here. So I don't really want to stack Philly. It's mostly due to their pricing. Stott, 45. Trey Turner's 53. Harper is 62. Castellano still 47. Schwarber at 5. That's a fine price tag for him, but it's kind of a below average matchup, I would say. Um, so I'm not going to go out of my way to target Stroman with the Phillies or target him on the mound at 8,800. I'm not crazy about this price tag necessarily. Ranger Suarez making his second start for Philly. Um, he only went about four innings, I believe, in his first outing. And we can't really take anything out of the value or anything, but he did throw six freaking pitches here. Um, had trouble spotting it and, and getting ahead of hitters. That's 40%. That's not good. So we'll have to see how he develops. Um, Ranger, I mean, uh, really what should jump out at us here is the price tag on DK, 6,300. Um, I don't really want to play this necessarily because I think the Cubs are, are probably going to get Nico back tonight. And he is a pest at the top of the lineup. He's a really, really good hitter. And all the other guys are really starting to heat up. Say Suzuki it has hit, what, I think three bombs in the last week or something. Price starting to climb up and bounce a little bit from that 3,600 where we saw him. He's at 41 now. But uh, all these other guys in the lineup, still very attainable price-wise. Dansby back up to 45. It's kind of whatever. Ian Happel hit from both sides of 43. We prefer him from the left side, but uh, he's fine from the right side. Have to see what they're going to do with Bellinger. He may still be out with a bruised knees. 47, I would probably stay off of that. Um, Patrick Wisdom, though, at 4,000 flat. That's nice. And Chris Morrell at 44. He'll probably be back down at the bottom of the lineup if they uh, bring back Cody Bellinger. If not, he'll he'll be up somewhere. Uh, so we'll have to, do what they, have to see what they want to do with the lineup, that is. Um, not my favorite stacking against Ranger here. I probably just kind of want to play the wait and see game. Uh, I'm not crazy about the Nico price at 5k. Uh, they're not going to send him out on a rehab. I don't think so. He may be a little bit cold coming back just right back into a uh, game speed or something like that. But Ranger uh, is probably going to be a little bit susceptible. Uh, he was very good last season. Of course, we we're paying in the mid nine K's uh, or upper eight K's and, and low nine K's. I, I guess I should say uh, for him last year. And, that means there's a pretty good bit of value at this particular price tag if he's the same guy. Um, now, I am probably going to play uh, the wait-and-see game with, with Ranger here. Um, he's spread out the—he threw mostly sinkers last season. So I like stacking against him last year. But, it, but he's appearing to spread out the arsenal a little bit. And that's going to make him hard to stack against in general with a full six pitches, he, even if, you know, they may not be uh, be fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to play the wait and see game, I think. But uh, at 6,300, there's probably upside for about, I don't know, maybe five innings. You're really just worried about pitch count here. I don't think he's going to be fully stretched out where we've got like 85 and 90 pitch upside necessarily. He's got to be incredibly efficient. And if the Cubs get Nico back tonight... Uh, he will probably make that a little bit difficult on him. So um, not really interested in pitching here, but really also not very interested in offense necessarily. Um, I don't want to stack the Phillies because they're expensive, and I don't like going after Stroman. And you can play the Cubs, though. I think that's fine going after some Ranger uh, if you want to attack some some depressed velocity uh, on his secondary pitches uh, in his first start. That's uh, notable for sure. 
Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Washington. Matt Boyd, I don't want to do this, man. Um, now, we're seeing his ownership kind of come down a little bit, but even at 10% here, I think this is kind of a bad spot for him, to be quite honest. 7,100 on DK over here, and the projection, you know, really sub-13 points. That's not great. So far, the, the strikeout stuff has been overall pretty underwhelming in aggregate. He, he popped for a start here or there, um, but... Really not outsized to either side of the plate so far. Uh, obviously, a, a short sample here against the lefties. We don't really want to be playing lefties against Matt Boyd historically anyway. Uh, it's been mostly righties. It's been hard contact and and barrel contact to the right side. And it still looks like he's got a little bit of a vulnerability there here in the early going this season. 280 average allowed with a 351 Wobe and a 169 ISO to them. Um one sixty four X ISO is a notable figure with just a twenty percent strikeout rate. So it's not so much in the hard contact so far that he's really been giving up. That's allowed him to survive. He's throwing a lot of strikes and he's getting some decent chase. Maybe spraying the baseball a little bit here with a full ten percent walk rate, really to both sides. So a little vulnerable. And I don't really want to go after Washington with a lefty. Now they're probably going to be missing their uh big power hitter, Joey Manessis. He's on the daddy list. Uh, but they only strike out in aggregate, even without a Joey Manessis, at a 17% clip against lefties, 115 WRC+. plus. Not going to hit for power or hard contact or anything like that, but they're going to hit it on a line, and they're going to create a little bit. They're very efficient. They can move. they got some guys with speed, and they can move on the base pass. So they've been efficient in, in driving in runs, and I think that's going to make them very difficult to attack because they don't strike out. And at 7,100, I'm not all that you know, thrilled about uh, going after some Matt Boyd here and playing him on the mound. I'd, I'd rather play some Washington pieces. They're probably still going to pop for us in value scores because they're all still very, very cheap. Now, their prices are coming up a little bit, um, but you can still play some of these guys, like a, a Jamer, Dillard from both sides, 31. Pr prefer him from the left side, but uh, right side's okay. Lane Thomas or an Alex Call, they're at 39 and 28, respectively, and, and playable. Caber behind the plate, not a lot of upside, but he's a four-hole catcher piece at 37. That's okay. So not my favorite to stack here because of the pricing, but I think they may be able to get after some Matt Boyd here and, and ding him up for maybe three or four runs or something. Um, that'll be hard to get you there in, in tournaments on a full 12 gamer, but it's enough to keep you off of Matt Boyd, I think. Jake Irvin on the mound, I'd rather probably get to Jake Irvin. Uh, don't tell anybody I said this, but uh, he's cheaper, and I think the matchup is markedly better here. I don't think I'm you know, really uh, breaking news when, when I say that. 6,700 here. Uh, we're going to have problems with raw strikeout upside for Irvin um, in general, but I think this is a very plus upside matchup for him. The Tigers are... are the same old Tiger, 76 WRC+, plus, 24% aggregate K rate. They don't walk. 31% hard is, you know, fine for a team, but a buck 12 ISO and a 281 Woba in aggregate against righties. This is a huge sample of 1,200 PAs. So I think Jake Irvin, if I had to choose between he and Matt Boyd, I'd, I'd, just, I'd just choose him. I'm not super thrilled. I think there's some vulnerabilities here in the underlying metrics. Don't get me wrong, right? Uh, but we've only got three starts on him so far, and he doesn't project to have a lot of strikeout stuff himself, so this 22% K rate is probably going to persist, to be quite honest, but he hasn't given up any power yet. And if he's able to stay on the ground and down in the strike zone with the sinker curveball, the change up here, if it offers him any value whatsoever, it's going to help him neutralize power to the left side. So, um, you know, you can get by with three plus secondary pitches or you know a plus fastball and two plus secondary pitches um you can survive with a, a below average maybe fourth fastball or something like that like we're seeing here in the four seamer so far um but this is mostly control and spraying it a little bit i'm a little worried that this change up value at just a, a five and six mile an hour velo delta to the fastballs is pretty noisy here so far so i'm a little concerned that some of these lefties over here that hit righties well, uh, like a McKintree, it's righties well. Riley Green is okay. Nick Maton might be back uh, for the Tigers. They, they all hit righties well. This change of value could be pretty noisy here, and that could get him picked apart a bit. But staying down in the strike zone, throwing the curveball a lot, 
over here, and that'll help him neutralize some of that power too. So uh, if I had to choose, just give me some Jake Irvin instead of Matt Boyd. Um, he's at half the ownership, he's cheaper, and the projection is basically the same, and the matchup is way better. So I don't know why we're playing Matt Boyd instead. Uh, I've got Baltimore and Toronto. I don't think we're going to be able to play pitching here either. I, at least I don't want to. Kyle Gibson, like I'm going to say this about him pretty much every start. He's so enigmatic, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like, he's got a full nine starts here, and this is a kind of uh, the threshold where we can start checking out these value scores and and gleaning a little bit of info. Uh, this change up here has been really good for him this season, but, the like, the sinker that he's still throwing a good bit is just break-even. The cutter's been terrible, and the four-seamer's been terrible. So I'm not really sure how he's eking value out of the changeup when every one of his fastballs is bad and yielding value to the field, right? So that's why he's he's just, like, super hard to figure out because you can never tell with Kyle Gibson in the six pitches that he throws if any of them are going to be any good. Um, in aggregate here, the slider change mix is keeping him down in the strike zone. He's still getting ground balls, getting a lot of ground balls to the left side. But with bad fastballs, he's still giving up power and a little bit of barrel contact really to both sides, definitely to the lefties in the power, right, and average for sure, 336 average to them, and 120 hitters, it's notable, 409 Wobo with a 215 ISO, just 15% K rate. So he's not throwing it by anybody, so I don't know where this value from the changeup is, is really coming from. Um, no hard contact, a little bit of soft, yeah, kind of whatever, a lot of ground balls, and that's really where he's been able to survive, uh, with this change, because he's getting so many ground balls on it. But to the right side is where he's really more susceptible contact-wise. 34% hard. I think there's some susceptibility in his arsenal as well. He's throwing strikes, but still pitching to a full 80% contact rate. And with an aggregate, 16.5% strikeout. So I, I don't want to play him against a very dangerous team over here in Toronto. Um, they're not going to strike out a lot themselves. And Kyle Gibson, if he's going to give up more hard contact to the right side, power to the left side, not strike anybody out. I mean, I don't want to deal with this. Um, so no thank you, even at what's kind of an okay price tag for him generally. But this is a terrible matchup, so I just would much rather get to Toronto. They'll be a pot, probably a top five stack for us today, I think. Um, and you can play pretty much everybody. George Springer over here is 4,200. Bo Bichette, he's probably been their best hitter. He and Matt Chapman uh, all season. Chapman's price coming down a little bit, 47 now, but Bichette is at 54. He's still kind of expensive. Vladdy, see if he's back tonight, 5,500 for him. Obviously, their best contact hitter. You can play Dalton Varsho still, 41, even though he's been pretty disappointing, uh, at least compared to the guy they traded him for in Lourdes Gurriel. Um, Witt has been fine, stealing a lot of bases. You can add in a Brandon Belt if Vladdy is out at 23. I'd much rather just play Vladdy if I had to choose even if he's 3200 more expensive. Uh, so you play a lot of Toronto, and I think getting to them is is pretty viable today. On the mound for them is Yusei Kikuchi, and I don't really want to play this price tag either. The projection's a little bit higher, so that makes it more palatable. But he's still seeing 10% ownership. This is a very good offense over here in Baltimore. I don't know why we're playing Kikuchi, because he's only got 23% K rate, really to both sides of the plate, a little bit higher to the righties, yeah, whatever, but he's still getting blasted by right-handers, 38.5% hard contact, 2.5 homers per nine, this is probably a little noisy in that figure, but a full 283 average with a 353 Woba and a 224 ISO, these are huge numbers, he's got a 243 X ISO to both sides of the plate. So he's still giving up barrel contact and hard contact. And despite the fact that he had maybe figured out a little bit of the uh, suppression from last season, at least, but like he's still giving up the contact. So I think he's probably going to get blown apart here once again, uh, probably pretty soon. Fastball's bad, change is bad, and the sliders just break even here. So, um, you know, he's giving it up everywhere in barrels. He's, the only plus metric here is really that he's not walking anybody. Um, so that'll make him a little bit harder to stack against, but not at these hard contact rates, man. 40% aggregate hard contact rate and pushing 200 hitters here with, a, like I said, a 243X ISO in aggregate. Uh, no thank you. I'm not dealing with this, and I I think this uh, ownership percentage should be zero with these underlying metrics. I don't think he's fixed anything from his, his 
woes last year. He's got a 91% strand rate so far this season. With these contact numbers, that is not going to persist. That's going to tank and just drop like a rock. So uh, no thank you with Yusei Kikuchi and having trouble. Like He's getting behind 45% of the hitters that he faces. No thanks. I'm not dealing with this. Give me Baltimore as well. If you want to get a little bit off the board in terms of a stack, I'd rather play them. Now, they're far more expensive, so they're not going to pop for us in value or anything like that. Uh, but I'd much rather get to them because I think the offense is better. Um, this is the plus slide of their So They're a 123 WRC plus compared to Toronto's just at a 105. Split adjusted here. They're walking more, striking out less, hitting for more average right than Toronto, hitting for more power. Not as much hard contact, but like whatever. Every other metric is, is much better. So um, – if I had to choose, give me Baltimore and give me zero pitching here. But I like Toronto uh, as a you know, pretty high upside stack as well against Kyle Gibson. Okay, Cleveland and the Mets. Uh, can't play Cal Quantrill either. Certainly not in this matchup. He didn't strike out anybody. You're only hoping that Cal Quantrill runs deep into a game in a very plus matchup, and he can maybe approach half a K in inning or something like that. Um, and against the Mets here, that's not going to happen in aggregate most often. They're starting to heat up a little bit now that Pete Alonso is starting to hit the ball over the wall. Uh, Nimmo still going to walk and make a lot of contact. Frankie Lindor going to do the same thing. And Jeff McNeil, they, they moved him up to the three hole now to try and get a little bit more stability in the top half of the lineup, having moved had to move Starling Marte down. He's dealing with a little bit of a hand injury as Marte. Um, so you have to keep an eye on him. I, th I believe he's like, kind of uh, jammed his finger into a into a base whenever he stole a base recently. Um, in any case, he's down to 4,100. They've had to drop him because he's been terrible at the plate. He's down in the sixth hole now. So they moved McNeil up, and that's going to make them even harder to go after because he didn't strike out. So can't do it with Cal Quantrill. His price tag's too high in this particular matchup and uh, is a horrible spot. So uh, I'd rather get to some of the Mets. Um you can play Nimmo at 47. It's okay. You can play Lindor for sure at 49 and McNeil at 36. He'll make these guys a lot cheaper. I do like getting to Pete Alonzo once again. He's really starting to heat up. And when he gets hot, man, like he's just going to hit bomb after bomb. He's he's kind of pretty similar to Aaron Judge in that respect. Uh, Brett Beatty's fine from the left side at 31 and some of the other high Upside prospects for them down at the bottom of the lineup, like Mark Vientos, Frankie Alvarez, something like that. These guys are fine to throw in stacks as well. Hard to get there generally with the Mets because they're a contact team, not a power team. But there's going to be a lot of contact here. 86% contact rate this season for Cal Quantrill. He's not throwing it past anybody. He's not going to walk anybody. So he's going to throw it over the plate and make you hit it. Um, and good for the Mets. Cookie on the mound, however, for that, I don't think we can do this. He's been terrible this season, and he's coming off elbow inflammation, and I'm not dealing with that uh, with a pitcher, uh, with especially with a pitcher with like uh, Carrasco, um, who has a very spotty health history, to put it, I guess, mildly. Um, 8200 I think the price tag's too high. It's a terrible matchup for him as well against Cleveland, who doesn't strike out. They're probably going to get Josie Ramirez back tonight. He's at 5,000 now. You could play this for sure. Stephen Kwan, he didn't strike out a lot. 45 at the top of the lineup for him. Ahmed Rosario, he's been awful, but uh, they still have him in the two-hole. So sure, if you want to play him in stacks, go ahead. Josh Naylor, we have to keep an eye on him. They might get him back tonight as well. Um, Andres Jimenez, they'll probably have to drop him back down to the five or the six because Jose Ramirez is going to be back. But he's a 4,300. You can still mix him in two stacks if you'd like. I think... Today might be one of these days that Cleveland is going to pop a little bit. Um, we generally don't like doing this on full 12 gamers, of course, because they just don't hit for any power. 108 ISO. So short stacks almost exclusively here. But, I mean, Cookie's been really bad. And I'm not dealing with the elbow inflammation. So I'm not playing him. And the velo is down. The pitch mix has looked awful. He's been walking everybody. He walked four guys, three guys in his first two starts. Then he only walked one in his next start, but he hit three batters. So, like, the the control is off, um, and I am not convinced he's healthy. He may very well not be fully stretched out, so we can't play him, and I'd much rather just stack against him. Um, not that I'm rooting that he's hurt or anything like that, but uh, I'm not taking financial risk with 
Carlos Carrasco. Um, th there's just no chance in in this particular matchup. So give me offense pretty much exclusively here, and f as full stacks, I I probably prefer Cleveland to be quite honest, just due to the pricing. Okay, Seattle and Atlanta this is a tough spot for these two young arms, man. I love Bryce Miller, but he's expensive, 9,400. We got some pretty questionable uh, early season noise here in these metrics. Um, it's not in the in the arsenal efficiency or anything like that. He's been fantastic. The fastball has been elite. And he's really seemed to figure out a lot of the command that was initially a question mark when he came up and has been throughout his minors career. He's got an 87.5% strand rate here with an 050 ERA with batted ball expected metrics far higher. So I think there's going to be some regression soon. He's not going to pitch to these kind of efficiency numbers for his entire career. He's not going to have a 1.5% walk rate his entire major league career. It's just not going to happen. Maybe he throws strike one at a 70% clip. I doubt it. But the chase is probably going to come down. Like, the strain rate's going to come down. The whip's going to go up. You know, there's going to be regression at some point. And if we're looking for that, like, he's on the barrel here, right, in terms of raw contact. He's given up a 40% hard contact rate to the right side so far. Hasn't translated into power or anything. Uh, but look at this fly ball number. 030 grumble to fly ball. Yeah, we're talking a sh very short sample here still. And just three starts for Miller. Uh, and he has been excellent. I love this kid. I love this arm. But... This is one of the best offenses in baseball, and I think the price tag's too high, so I'm not super jacked about playing this and going out of my way. Now, he's only 4% owned. He still has the upside to pick through this lineup because the Braves are still going to strike out a little bit, 23.5% against righties this season, and just an average creation here to 99 WRC+. They will hit for power, and they will hit for hard contact, and they will walk. So if these numbers up here are going to regress for for Bryce Miller, they're probably going to regress pretty quickly. Uh, certainly the walk rate, certainly the strand rate. If he starts walking people and giving up hard contact, then, you know, runs are going to come across the plate here. So um, I think you can get to some Atlanta kind of off the board stacks here. I don't want to generally stack against this kid because I really respect this arsenal. Four seamer slider curveball. Very, very efficient. But overall, um, I think he's kind of due for a stinker sometime, and what better offense in baseball to provide that than the Atlanta Braves? Uh, a lot of power, so you can definitely stack them if you want to go after this kid. Same thing with Bryce Elder on the other side. Uh, he's a little cheap. I'd probably prefer to play him if I had to choose between the two. Number one, the projection's four points higher. Okay, let's start there. Um, the ownership, yeah, three three ticks higher, whatever. That's fine, but I think he's kind of overpriced too. I've got a little bit of worry with his strand rate as well. I think he's going to regress also. Um, now, we've got more of a sample on him, but still, 86% strand rate is, is too high. This is not sustainable long term. He's got about two runs of regression coming to him in, in the run suppression department as well with a 2-0 ERA and, and expected you know, in the four range. So... Uh, sub 10% swinging strike rate. He's been down in the strike zone, getting a lot of ground balls here. But look at this hard contact over here. Generally, we don't care about that if everything is on the ground. But like north of 45% is is like, okay, 45% of the time he's given up a, a barreled baseball um, or effectively a barreled baseball. That, like That's pretty worrisome here. So, And this is a full eight starts, right? We're talking a 200 hitters nearly with 45% aggregate hard contact rate, no soft contact whatsoever. So based on the on the expected batted ball metrics, um, these numbers are still okay, X, at the XBA, the XWOB, and the XISO. But I think we're probably going to see a little bit of regression here too. This 4-0 ground ball to fly ball, this is only sustainable for the most elite starting pitchers in baseball. Could he be one of them? Eh, maybe. Um, I don't think he is quite yet, though. You're going to need more value out of a four-seamer in your sinker. I don't care if the slider's been this good. Uh, if you can't establish with your fastball, you're probably going to have uh, some problems here. Not to mention, in, in DFS, we need strikeouts, and he's only got a 21% aggregate K rate. So can you go after Seattle? Yeah, they're just an average offense against righties as well. They'll strike out more than, than Atlanta. They'll walk a little bit less, makes a little bit less hard contact, and, and hit for less power. So I, if I had to choose between Miller and uh, Elder here, I'd probably choose Elder. But 
I really don't want to play that either because I think there's some regression coming for both of these guys, and the price tags are pretty high here. So not super thrilled about this. I'd rather just get up to Alcantara uh, or a Joe Ryan or something like that, guys who we'll talk about later. So mostly just offense here for me. Do you want to play Seattle? I mean, ugh, it's kind of disgusting because the three guys you want to play are Julio, Kelnick, and Cal Raleigh, and they're 55, 5,000, and 4,900 respectively. Uh, everybody else has really just been dread dreadful. I think Ty France make it cheaper for you at 4,000, but you got to play him at first base, kind of stiff. And Elder's got a 4-0 ground ball to fly ball ratio against righties so far this season, so that's not great. Um, and J.P. Crawford, not a whole lot of upside. He's, he's got upside at his 3,400 price tag leading off. But the power hitters, like a Teoscar Hernandez, he's been terrible too. So uh, Gino has just been you know, kind of a paperweight in the middle of the lineup all season. So hard to stack them, I think. So it's why I prefer Elder as opposed to the Mariners, but really not thrilled about getting to anybody, including the Braves offense. But if I had to choose, it'd be like Braves, Elder, Bryce Miller, and, the, and then the Mariners, I think. But I mean, I don't know. It's kind of a kind of a gross spot there. Okay, Colorado and Texas. Uh, Carl Kaufman making his debut, getting called up for the Rockies. Um, well, they got four guys out in their starting rotation. So, unfortunately for Kaufman, this is a bad spot. Uh, they just need they need some arms because Herman Marquez is out. Noah Davis is out. Um, who else is out? Uh, Ryan Feltner got hit in the skull with a freaking baseball and it cracked his head open. So, you know, they're missing a lot of guys here. Um, Senza is, is down with an elbow as well. So um, they just need some more arms. And sure enough, like Carl Kaufman, uh, you drew the short straw against Texas. They just got their best hitter back, Corey Seager. He's 4,800. Yeah, you can play him. You can stack Texas definitely. They're one of the top five stacks of the day. Because Carl Kaufman's numbers here in the minors are, are noisy. Number one, he plays in the PCL, and most of his home starts – uh, well, all of his home starts, at least, uh, are in Albuquerque, which is a launching pad. Uh, they don't do the humidor shenanigans down there, so they, they give up m way more runs than Coors Field. Um, so his numbers are undoubtedly inflated, but he's still got a, a buck eighty whip. means you're pitching to contact and walking people, and a 6-0 XFIP. So 10% um, swinging strike rate in, in the upper minors in the last two seasons, and about a 10% walk rate, give or take. Um, neutral ground ball to fly ball, it's like ground ball lean, but he'll be on a line for sure. And those contact numbers you can't really fake. Uh, how they translate into run suppression and results, yeah, that's got those numbers are going to be inflated playing in the PCL because every hitter park in that league nearly is uh, is super. Um, or every ballpark, I think I said hitter park. Every ballpark is super hitter friendly in that league in the PCL. So uh, the suppression numbers are always going to be inflated for these guys. That said, the contact numbers itself are not there. And at 5,000, you just can't play the guy. There's, I, I don't think, any upside in this particular matchup. You're definitely going to want to get to some Texas. Um, and we're still expecting Colorado's bullpen to implode sooner or later. Martin Perez on the mound for the Rangers, 7,700. He's not been very good in his last two starts. Now, two difficult-ish matchups, uh, and this is a little bit better, admittedly. Um, Rockies against lefties, 425 PAs this year, 70 WRC+, plus, 24.5% K rate, buck 40 ISO with a 31.5% hard. Not going to walk a lot, but they will hit the baseball on a line here and with a little bit of hard contact. So against righties this season, I mean, Martin Perez not generating any ground balls. He's basically been in the air. And he's given up some pop to the right side and a lot of average. 303 average, 367 Woba with a 200 ISO to the right side. And I think this is very attackable. He's throwing a lot of strikes and pitching to a lot of contact here. 70% strike one, 81% contact. So the ERA and the expected metrics are right about in range where I think these numbers should uh, put them. And he's given up a little bit of power here and he's been susceptible not getting nearly as many ground balls as he has in the past it's because the sinker cutter change mix really has not been all that equitable sinker's not been good he's floating this this pitch and it's floating back over the barrel so uh, he's giving up a, a lot of contact and a 357 average in a shorter sample against lefties is notable as well hasn't translated to power 
to the left side, but a 380 Woba, he's not walking anybody. So it's this is straight contact uh, and, and base hits against Martin Perez. So I think that's going to make him a little bit difficult to play, even at an attractive price tag for him. Uh, I thought it was a pretty decent suppression metric in his last outing against Oakland, and, and I got proved wrong pretty damn quickly there. Same sort of thing. This is a fine suppression matchup for him, but the underlying metrics here are not very encouraging so far. He's only got a 9% swinging strike rate. This was far higher last year at the 12-13% range, so something is wrong with Martin Perez here. He just hasn't been feeling it so far. Is he likely to regress given his historical performance? Yes. Uh, the sinker is likely to be much better. Cutter likely to be much better. Um, but this cutter is, is floating back over the middle of the plate too, rather than running in on the hands to right-handers like you want it to. So uh, it's a little worrisome. He's only got a 16.5% K rate. And I don't know why we're playing 15% uh, Martin Perez when his K rate matches his ownership. I, I, I'm just, <laughs> you know, no thank you. Um so I think you could probably get to a little bit of the Rockies here. Their offense is heating up, despite the fact that they've been terrible all season, and they're outside of Coors Field. Generally, a hitter's ball or a pitcher's ballpark now in Texas. But uh, Chris Bryant's five thousand. You could play that. Elias Diaz has been probably the best, one of the best hitting catchers in baseball so far this season. Uh, Grichik is fine at forty three. Higher contact, and the young kids, Brenton Doyle, Z Tovar, Mike Tolia, they're all going to make a lot of contact too against lefties. Tolia will strike out a little bit more, not so much for Brenton Doyle and Z Tovar. Uh, Alan Treo, we'll see. I mean, against lefties, they're probably going to platoon he and Harold Castro now. So, 3,100, he's likely to be in there as well. Jury Profar is going to hit from the right side too, seeing the baseball a little bit better. I think you can get to them tonight and take some shots against what's I think too high um, a number in the ownership department here for Martin Perez. I'm not super thrilled about this. Now, the projection is high, uh, but it was this high against Oakland, too, and he got picked apart. So underlying metrics here are suggesting to me that this projection, this median projection, is probably a bit aggressive. Um, you can get some pieces, definitely. I think 16% is a bit is a bit on the high side, but I'd prefer to probably get to some rocky stacks if I can make it happen. Um, they never project well, and they're going to project well down the list. <laughs> uh, in terms of value so far, they're second to last, as a matter of fact. So um, you'd have to force it in, but I think I might want to try and force in a couple of teams here if this ownership figure on, per on Martin Perez gets out of control. Uh, I think you can play both sides there. Definitely Texas, no Kaufman. Uh, okay, Oakland and Houston, no wall to chuck, definitely. Uh, we're, we can keep this short. We're not going anywhere near this. 12% walk rate. 10, 10.5% barrel rate, 238 X ISO with a 300 realized to the right side and a 275 realized to the left side. Um, huge average, huge WOBA. It's because the walks, I mean, everything here is miserable for Ken Waldachuk. Uh, fastball's bad, changeup's bad, slider's bad, curveball's bad. Uh, not a single plus metric that you can really look at did way too much hard contact. Maybe it's a little bit of soft contact at 18% to the right side, but there's fly balls and, and he's just on the barrel. So we're, we're not going anywhere near this with Houston. 17% aggregate strikeout rate against lefties run creation here is probably going to spike quite a bit. Given this particular matchup tonight, hard contact, they may very well get Jose Altuve back tonight. So we'll see what they want to do there. Um, he's been a little cold in the minors in his rehab, so might take him a, a little bit to get going back at game speed in the bigs, but um, you can still play him. He's Jose Altuve. It's, it's fine, and this is what's effectively a minor league arm over here in Kellen Waldachuk. This is a terrible, terrible arsenal. Is there going to be regression for him positively? I don't think so, because he didn't show any good stuff last year against the right side of the plate, and they've got seven righties that they're going to throw at him tonight. Uh, and they might get Jose Altuve back, as I mentioned. So um, can't go near Waldachuk, even at a, a depressed price tag. Uh, this should be like negative 6% ownership. Um, like he should get blasted here tonight. Brandon Belock on the mound for the Strohs. I think this is a playable price. Um, now he's not striking anybody out yet either. Just two starts, so can't really take anything out of most of the metrics here. But we can take a little bit out of that he's throwing five pitches, right? Um, not so much the cutter. He'll probably throw a little bit more of this, given that he throws a slider so much. But four-seamer, sinker, slider, curveball change, 
Uh, so he's got enough. He's got five pitches that he can really work with. And this is Oakland, right? Um, he's not projecting all that high. Like, you'd love to see 13, 14 points. But he's at 12 and a half. I mean, whatever, point and a half in a projection is is pretty noisy, if you ask me. He's completely ignored so far uh, sub-10% ownership. And if you're playing Houston stacks, they're, they're going to be the most popular team today, definitely. Um targeting wall to Chuck. So I think you can get off of some of that ownership and, and play some B lock and some correlated teams. He's very likely to be able to survive about five innings here, maybe even upside for six against Oakland. They're dreadful against right-handed pitching. Um, and he's going to get some run support. So I think you could maybe even squeeze another four points out of him tonight, given that Houston is likely to be uh, ahead in this game. Oakland is awful, 89 WRC plus, 26% K rate. They're going to walk a little bit, but not going to make any hard, and a sub buck 50 ISO with a sub 300 Woba. So um, not all the tr- all that attractive here. Now, Belak's going to pitch to some contact, 81% so far, and he's having trouble getting ahead of hitter. So if you want to play in Asteria Ruiz, if he walks at all, uh, he's going to steal. If he gets on base, because... Belak's pitching to contact. He's going to steal. So there's still value on him at 3,600. He's leading baseball in stolen bases. Um, you can play Ryan Nota, 2,800. He's a cheap piece. You can pl- always play Brent Rooker. He's still 3,900. He's leading baseball in OPS. So J.J. Blade is still a playable piece. 3,000. Shea behind the plate or any of the ancillary pieces down at the at the lower half of the lineup are playable as well. If you want to get to an off the board Oakland stack, I think it's okay because Belak's going to pitch to so much contact, but I also think he's playable at 6,200. I think he's got upside to blast through this price tag, but I also think that that Oakland has a little bit of upside as well. Definitely hard to get there with them on full slates, um, but they're cheap and they're, they'll make it easy to, you know, stack Houston on the other side if you want to do that. If you want to stack this game, I think that's okay. Run a 5-3 or something like that. I think that's an okay construction. And they'll allow you to get to a Joe Ryan or, or an Alcantara up at the top. So I think that's very playable. And you can play everybody in Houston, uh, including the lefties. Don't worry about that. Um, it's just ownership that you're going to have to balance there. Okay, Kansas City and Chicago. Let's move on to Zach Greinke and Michael Kopech. Can't play Zach Greinke either, uh, of course. But can we stack against him? I don't know. Ugh. I just hate doing it, man. Like, he's got 24 pitches. He throws each one of them 72 miles an hour, and, like, he doesn't walk anybody. He's got great control still, and he's very hard to attack. Uh, he'll give up three runs or four runs or whatever in most outings, but he's still, like, that. that's about it in the production. And we talked about in the last couple of slates that the Royals' bullpen has actually been pretty damn respectable above average for the bullpen, even though we they – had to eat some innings earlier in the season, and then they gave up some production. They, in aggregate, been pretty okay. Now, Grinky is giving up, giving up some production, of course. He's going to give up some average, 294 XBA with a 345 X Woba and a 192 X ISO. So these are attackable figures here um, in general. And can you stack against that? Well, it, it's hard because he's still only walking sub-5% of hitters. So he throws strikes. He throws early. Yeah, he pitches to a lot of contact, but... He doesn't walk people, and that's really where we need to get to realize the the upside of a, a full stack because everybody always stacks against Granky, and every hitter is always, I guess, inordinately popular against him. Um, and it, it it makes for some pretty easy fades a lot of the time. Now, today with the White Sox, I think this is an okay matchup for them. Am I like a, a staunch opponent of stacking against Granky today? No. But do I want to like go out of my way and, and eat a lot of ownership on, on the White Sox? I mean, it's a 12 game slate. Don't get me wrong. It, it, you're not going to see a lot of ownership here, but no, I, I generally don't want to eat a bunch of ownership on some of these more popular guys. Tim Anderson, he'll be popular. Luis Robert going to be popular as well as will Yoan Moncada and Gavin Sheets. And those are really the guys you want to play. Uh, there's not a lot of multi-position. El- there's zero multi-position el- eligibility. Um, in any of the projected White Sox starting lineup here. So, like, every single one of your White Sox stacks is going to be the same as everybody else's, you know, it's because you can't play anybody, you can't move anybody around outside of, like, a Hanser Alberto, and you're not playing him on a 12-game slate. So, um, makes it very hard to differentiate 
with full five-man stacks of the White Sox here, which is why I'm kind of, you know, lukewarm on it. Yeah, take some pieces, of course. I like Gavin Sheets for sure. Um, Benintendi's ground ball hitter, really, and Granky's still inducing buck 75 ground balls per fly ball to the left side of the plate. There's some line drives here, so that plays into the White Sox' favor a little bit to both sides of the plate. Um, you know, so it's a, it's an okay stack. It's just not one of my favorites personally because I hate stacking against Granky. I do like stacking against Michael Kopech, though. Uh, even though he's got a little bit of whiff stuff to the left side of the plate, 27%, he still gives up barrel contact, 18.5% barrel rate. In a full 200 hitter sample here this season, that is astronomical. That's like twice as high as you'd like to see. Um, he's having trouble throwing it over the plate. He's walking everybody. He has no chase in him. He has a sub 10% swinging strike rate. Mega hard contact to both sides. So if I if I prefer stacks, it's going to be the Royals, even though they're terrible against right-handed pitching. 78 WRC plus, 25% K rate. But they make a lot of hard contact here, man, and they're going to hit the baseball in the air and on a line. So um, I think this is a very high upside spot for the Royals, and they're really kind of down the list a little bit um, generally, because they, they, certainly against right-handed pitching, but they're not going to be that down that far down there today. They're going to pop in ownership. They may be one of the more popular teams, but I think they're a top stack here today for sure. Uh, Kopech is absolutely attackable. I don't think he's going to regress nearly as hard as somebody like a like a Lance Lynn, for example, uh, in terms of the batted ball metrics. These batted ball metrics were this bad last year as well. So nothing's really changed for Kopech. Uh, the velo is, is completely gone. I mean, he's still throwing 96, but he used to throw 100 before he had TJ. So uh, the control is gone. Everything is terrible here. And I don't like the price tag either. You know, 7,400. I'd rather just get to the Royals and play all those guys, including Bobby Witt and including Salvi Perez. Not worried about the chase rate there for those guys because Michael Kopech is just going to walk them uh, and throw it outside the strike zone. Like, none of this stuff is competitive out of the hand for Kopech here. So give me a lot of the Royals and give me some of the White Sox for sure, um, even though I don't generally like going after Granke. Should be some offense here in this game tonight. Okay, uh, Dodgers and the Cardinals. Tony Gonsolin on the mound for the Dodgers. 8,900. Now he's stretched out, but I'm not going after this offense. Uh you know, we maybe could have done it with Luis Urias last night, but he gave up like four homers in an inning, right? So, and he's given up to left to the left side, to the right side. Like this entire offense is like flaming hot right now, um, and, and I'm not going near it. I'm just not doing it. Now, is Tony Gonsolin one of the arms, similar to like a Corbin Burns, that could suppress them for five, six innings or something? Yeah, he's got enough of that in the arsenal. Um, Short sample here, so we can't really take a lot of out out of the metrics or anything so far this season. But Tony Gonsolin is one of the better arms, one of the better starting pitchers that doesn't really get a lot of credit for it in baseball. Um, and, he, I mean, he's not going to be played at all. So, you know, there there's that. Uh, does he have more upside than 2% ownership here? Probably. Does he have 23, 24 points in him? More than 2% of the time? Uh, yeah, probably. So you could play him in that regard, but I'm not going out of my way to play him. Um, do I think he's underpriced for his general upside? Eh, probably. But once again, like this this offense is is super, super hot right now. They put up 16 runs last night. Um, again. And they've done it like three times in the last week. So no thank you. I'm not going near them. Every damn one of them is seeing the baseball. Um and they'll go at they'll get after even very good arms. You know, it's uh it's very difficult to attack this lineup right now. Steven Matz not difficult to attack because he's dreadful. Um I I don't like playing this guy. Like he's got some of the strikeout stuff to the left side. He's always had strikeout stuff to the left side, but he's never had strikeout stuff to the right side. So, I'm not dealing with this. Uh I'm still not playing him and definitely not playing him against the Dodgers. I want to get to the Dodgers. Um now they're really down in the about middle in value and ownership so far. And I think this is a super attackable spot. Steve Matt's having trouble getting ahead of hitters. He has no chase in him anymore, just a 10% swinging strike rate, but most of that's to the left side because he's only got an aggregate 20% K rate to the righties. 200 ISO with a 403 Woba and a 341 average allowed to the right side. It, it, like the Woba is super, super high. Not because he's walking people though. It's all contact. 34% 
hard contact with 1.7 homers per nine in 150 hitter sample here. These numbers, he's always had problems with righties. It's because he throws a two seamer. And when this two seamer is bad, he will float it and it will go over the wall. So uh, give me the Dodgers here. Definitely. Um, you can play Mookie. He got half the game off last night. 56. That's fine. You can play Freddie. Sure. Will Smith, 53. It's fine. Give me some JD. Give me some Chris Taylor. Uh, I think he's much less likely to strike out in this particular matchup, even though he probably still will. Uh, price adjusted, I think my two favorite plays would be a Miggy Vargas, Trace Thompson. Throw in Mookie there as well. But I like all of the righties, and you can throw in a Max Muncy and Will Smith. Muncy hitting lefties a little bit better. Uh, he had a bomb off Henesis Cabrera last night too, So who is a lefty um, and throws like seeds. So... Steven Matz, definitely attackable. Pretty much everybody on the Dodgers here. So no pitching, mostly for me. Maybe a couple of Gonsolin pieces because he's underpriced for his relative upside. Not for the matchup and for the ownership. But eh, it's, it's a pretty, pretty difficult spot here. I like offense. You can stack this game if you want. Um, not crazy stacking the Cardinals, but uh, you know the, the offense is way, way hot right now. Okay, Minnesota and the... Angels, uh, Joe Ryan on the mound for Minnesota. Yeah, I, I love this. This is a guy I want to get to up above 10. Um, and everything, he's had two clunkers this year. I think one of them was, this, it may have been against these Angels. Uh, one of them was against Cleveland when it was like 14 degrees out. And another one was, uh, let's see if I can pull this up here on the other side, or on the other mile. It was against Boston. That's what it was. Um, Every other start, however, has been north of 25 points. So, yeah, give me all of the Joe Ryan. The split change and sweeper combination that he's introduced this season uh, are elite. His fastball has always been elite. And it's really where he's get, getting most of the value. It's the four-seamer and the split change here. Um, sweeper really kind of surprisingly not eking up, eking out enough value just yet. But he's still got a 36% carry to the right side. He's throwing this split change to the righties as well, getting so much swing and miss. Look at this chase rate, 42%. This is off the charts. Like, not probably not sustainable long term, but um, like this is incredibly high. 73% strike one rate. Like, he is feeling all of it right now, and he's super confident on the mound. Now, he's pitching to a, a bit flatter and a neutral ground ball to fly ball ratio than he has in the past. Last year, he was about an 050 ground ball to fly ball. This year, he's about neutral. Um, giving up a few more line drives to the right side this year. Uh, this is kind of a noisy sample, but he's been so efficient. Uh, he's going deep into games. He's just not seeing any hitters yet. So we only have a 200 hitter sample. This is a full eight starts. And some guys that we've seen, we've got 250 hitters nearly. So... Uh, he's not walking anybody. He's off the barrel. This barrel rate's probably going to come up in aggregate, but walk rate may. But he's always had elite control. Uh, everything here in, in the arsenal, like 14% swinging strike rate is fantastic. Not getting a lot of called strikes, but he doesn't need them because he's got so much chase, right? So, uh, yeah, give me 10-3. I think he's underpriced here. And 24% ownership, even against the Angels, Kind of a difficult lineup to attack with righties in general, but this is a well above average right-hander. Uh, as of right, like he's been a top five arm in baseball this year for sure. 105 WRC plus for the Angels, 22.5% K rate, 33% hard contact, buck 67 ISO. These are all fine, and they're starting to kind of heat up a little bit. Trout definitely, he's got homers in, in back-to-back games, I think. Shohei hit a ball out yesterday too. Given that Joe Ryan is pitching to a, a little bit more neutral ground ball to fly ball this year, you can play, you can have more confidence stacking against him. Um, that said, I'm not stacking against him, even with Trout and Otani. Uh, you can play them against everybody, don't get me wrong, but Trout's a fly ball hitter, and he's still, Joe Ryan, a fly ball lean to the right side of the plate. So he's going to stay up in the strike zone, and he's going to get guys to pop the ball up. That said, this is much better, a much better number to attack than an 050 like it was last year. And you could do that with Trout. It's it's perfectly fine to play. Um, if you want to play a completely unknown Trout, completely unknown Otani, they're not going to see any ownership today. So you can play those guys. you got to pay for them, but you can play them. Uh, outside of that, I'm not stacking the Angels. Maybe throw in like a Matt Dice behind the plate, 2,500. He'll be in the middle of the lineup. 
um, and that'll give you like a a nice little three man there. But like I don't know, it's not all that exciting. Rather just eat it on Joe Ryan. If he gets beat up, he gets beat up. Reed Detmer's on the mound for the Angels, 7,900 for him. Eh, this is okay. Eh, I don't know. I'm historically I've been pretty uh pretty lukewarm on Reed Detmer's. I haven't been overly impressed with the Arsenal really. But he's getting results this year, and you can't really ignore that. Doesn't have a lot of chase. I, w I would like more chase out of this um, with a four-seamer slider curveball mix than we're really getting. He doesn't really have the changeup, so he's going to be a little bit susceptible in contact and, and power to the right side. And as we see here, it hasn't translated so much into ISO, but 42% hard contact to righties so far. Uh, this season, that's a huge number, and there's fly balls, so you can attack that with righties on the other side for the Twins, and that's really Correa, and that's Buxton, Kyle Farmer, Kyle Garlick also re just got called up, they have Jeffers, Michael A. Taylor types of guys as well, so they can platoon here, uh, you're not playing Donnie Solano, at least he's got second base eligibility now, so you don't have to play him at sole first base, he's 2100, um, there's a little bit of value in, in stacking the Twins here from the right side of the plate. Probably not going to strike out as much as this 27.5% number says they are because they'll have fewer lefties in the lineup. But undoubtedly, in aggregate, 350 PAs, 84 WRC+, plus with the 27.5% Ks, average ISO, 32% hard is, is notable, and they're still hitting the ball in the air, but they're popping a lot of them up. So 13% infield fly ball rate is very high. It's about three ticks higher than you want to see. Um, so they'll they'll hit it in the air, get it on the line here a little bit. I think it's a viable right-handed stack here to go after some Reed Detmers because he doesn't have the change. Undoubtedly, though, like he's still got a 28% K rate, and that's coming from the curveball swing and miss that he's getting down in strike zone. So, uh, 13% swing strike rates encouraging with a 28% CSW. It's all fine, but I think this is attackable. Uh, if you land on a Reed Detmers, I think it's okay to play him on the mound because the Twins have been bad, but I think it's also all right if you want to take some short Twin stacks here. They're going to be well down the list, of course, um, but you know, as of right now in, in value metrics, because some of these guys are really, really cheap, including Correa and Buxton, who are the most expensive, uh, they're going to pop in, in the value metrics. It's just because they're cheap. Um, I think it's okay to, to really play both sides here. Really not in any outsized exposures. I think 5 to 10% Reed Detmers is plenty. I don't want to get any more than this. Uh, and I think a couple, you know, some 5% mid twin stacks is, is probably okay as well. Um, so mostly just Joe Ryan, maybe a little bit of the twins, probably no angels, maybe some Detmers, I think. Okay, Boston and San Diego. James Paxton making his second start here. Uh, I'm not. De I'm not doing this. Um, 8,300. I'm. I'm still in wait and see mode with Paxton. Now he struck out a lot of guys in his first outing, uh, but we we can't take anything out of these numbers yet. Um, I'm still in wait and see mode, and this price tag's too high. If he were 6,300, yeah, we might be able to consider it. I think. But I'm not doing this. Uh, the Padres are. This is a terrible matchup. Padres not going to strike out against lefties, and they're going to create a little bit more here with Tatis a little bit healthy, um, or you know back in the lineup, but if you want to call that healthy, um, 61 for him. Bogarts up to 5,000 against his old team. Sure, if you want to play the revenge narrative, whatever. Uh, Soto's up to 59 now, so kind of stiff for these three guys. Um, Got to keep an eye on Manny. I'm not sure if they actually put him on the DL. Uh, they may have. In any case, he got hit in the hand. And no, he's not on the DL, but um, he did fracture his left hand. So we'll see. Uh, they'll probably end up having to put him on the DL. Uh, I mean, the fracture could be any anything like a... You know, it could be a very small break, and it just needs you know a week or two to heal or something like that. Uh, or it could be more serious than that. So he's probably pretty unlikely to be in the lineup as it is with a broken hand. Um, so that leaves a lineup spot open for like a Nelly Cruz, Hassan Kim, Adam Engel you'll probably need to play if you're playing Tatis Bogarts up at the top. Uh, he's 2,000 is Engel down at the bottom. Not playing any lefties against Paxton. He's always been very good against the left side. And Ruggie Odor... Um, it, and like Trent Grisham, these guys are awful. So it'll probably be Engel instead of Grisham, that said. 
in any case, I'm not playing Paxton. I'd rather get to some Padres here. Uh, they're coming, I mean, pretty far down the list because they're so expensive. That's the Tatis, Bogarts, and Soto prices. Uh, if you want to go after Paxton, probably maybe in some short stacks, nobody's going to be on these guys because they're so expensive. So I think this is very reasonable to get to a late night short stack against Paxton um, and and target what's likely to be some variance. I want to see how things shake out with him before I start getting excited about playing him and uh, definitely not in, in subpar matchups. Okay, here we are. Blake Snell, uh, 8,500. I'm, I'm just not playing him. Uh, I'm not doing it at this ownership figure. Uh, I like. I don't understand why a guy with a 52% strike one rate is 30% owned. Uh, I think this is incredibly exploitable. Um, he cannot throw it over the plate. Now, I don't care if he's striking out 28% of lefties. Boston's going to platoon here, and the two lefties, that or three lefties, I guess, that they're likely to have in the lineup, outside of Jaron Duran, who does strike out, are Alex Verdugo, Rafi Devers, and, and Masataki Yoshida, who don't strike out at all. He, uh, Yoshida's got a 13% K rate. Same with Devers. His is a little bit higher against lefties. Verdugo's a little bit higher against lefties, but it's not above the average, which is <laughs> what you need from Blake Snell here. And he can't throw strikes, man. The right-handers, Justin Turner, Rob Refsnyder, Kike, Pablo Reyes, Connor Wong, they've all been fantastic this year. Pablo, short sample, of course, since they just called him up, but they're all great against lefties, uh, at least historically. So I'm not dealing with this. They've all seen him, of course, at least Justin Turner and Kike Hernandez. Um, and Alex Verdugo, for that matter, from their days with the Dodgers. So they're not uh, unfamiliar with Blake Snell here. And I think this ownership is way too high. These underlying metrics are awful. Uh, like the walk rate is 14%. He only goes five innings max, but he's still throwing 100 pitches. Strand rate is high. That's because he's got some whiff stuff. But fastball's bad. Changeup has really only allowed him to survive a little bit, but he's still giving up a 214 ISO to the right side. Look at these hard contact numbers. 36 per, 37% in aggregate. Two homers per nine to the righties. I'm not dealing with any of this. I think this ownership number is out of control wrong. Um, now, he might... Since I'm so bearish on Blake Snell in general, he might make me look like an idiot. But I'm prepared to eat that. Sometimes he does that. Um, and, I, and I'm prepared to... Totally faded, but I'm not going anywhere near this. This is total nonsense. He can't throw strikes, man, and he doesn't have any chase rate in him either. So uh, no thank you. Give me offense. Give me Boston here, um, stacking against a very popular pitcher. I think this is totally inverted, uh, and I'm going to do it. It might make me look like an idiot, but um, give me some Boston pieces. I think Blake Snell's strand rate is probably going to just absolutely tank. Look at the XERA at least compared to the ERA of 460, uh, it, it's a, a run higher. And, it, like, I don't know what we're doing here. I know the, the projection is high, but I, I don't see how it's this high. Um, you know, the models are smarter than I am. So, you know, the, but I, you know, I'm just taking stands here. I'm not going near this Blake Snell. Okay, rant over there. Give me offense only. Boston for sure. Some Padres definitely, but uh, no pitching. Okay, Miami and uh, San Francisco, last game of the night here. 9,800 for Sandy Alcantara. Yeah, you can play him too. He's going to be more popular than Joe Ryan, and I'd rather play Joe Ryan, I think. Um, although you can play Sandy too. He's given it up a little bit to the left side here in the early going this year, uh, much more so than last year. In aggregate, just a 23% K rate. This is five ticks lower than it was last year. So he's struggling a little bit uh, with the... You know, with the right-handers in particular in terms of raw whiff stuff. Strikeout stuff to the lefties is still there. Uh, but it's because of the four-seamer. It hasn't been nearly as equitable. He's not throwing as hard. He's Velo's down about a tick or so. Um, so he's still trying to get it figured out, I think, and giving up some hard contact to the left side. So that makes the ownership here, as it drifts up toward 30%, a little uh, notable for sure. Now he's still getting ground balls, of course, buck 40 in aggregate, ground ball to fly ball. This is all fine. Still has a lot of chase with the changeup slider down in the strike zone. And, and that keeps him off the barrel, and he did, still didn't walk people. So this is still Sandy, and he's still elite, and I still love this arm. You can absolutely play him at 98 over here on DK. Uh, high, very high median projection. He's projecting higher than Joe Ryan, though, so that's why his ownership is coming in so high. Um, I think there's probably a delta there. 
in an exploitable kind of spot that we can get to with some Joe Ryan, but it's not like huge because the Giants over here, they're still going to strike out, still missing Jock, right? Um, but they're going to platoon here with Lamont Wade, Michael Conforto. You could play him if you want to, 3,300. That's a good price for him. Uh, Mitch Hanniger, he'll hit right. He's okay. And not going to strike out as with uh, Sandy's lower strikeout rate. So you can play some, some Yaz also. At 41, kind of elevated in this particular matchup, but uh, they're going to be a little bit more right-handed heavy than they will, you know, since they're missing Jock, right? Um, so I think this is an, definitely an attackable spot still for Sandy. 25% aggregate K rate. They're going to walk. They're going to hit for power. Excuse me. And they're going to hit it over the wall. So um, it's fine to fade Sandy if you'd, if you'd like to do that and pivot um, and just not deal with very high ownership. But this game's in San Francisco at 55 degrees at night. And this guy won the Cy Young last year. So... I mean, do we really want to be going out of our way to fade that? Uh, probably not. So uh, Sandy, for sure, less of the Giants, but maybe if you want to play some late singleton pieces like a Conforto or a Lamont Wade, somebody that can lift the baseball, get it in the air, I think that's okay. He's been giving up a buck sixty-five ISO to the left side so far this year with the 40% hard contact, as we mentioned. So little susceptibility there in terms of the batter ball profile uh, for Sandy, but you know, outside of that, nothing's really wrong. I, I do like him on the mound a good bit. Di Sclafani on the mound for the Giants. His last two starts have been terrible. Um, and I think we're kind of getting back into Di Sclafani mode, where it's just like, eh, all right, whatever. Changeup has not been good in his last couple of starts, even though he's seeing some value in his eight starts so so far this season. Uh, the fastball mix has been bad. Uh, he's relying mostly on the slider here, which is, allowed him to survive and what's really getting him more strikes down in the strike zone and a lot of ground balls but with a bad fastball mix can't spot the four seamer and he's still throwing the two seamer this change of value is going to regress pretty significantly it's still just a seven mile an hour velo delta for a change to really overcome bad fastball value it's got to be north of 10 uh, miles an hour in the velo delta with the exact same release point where you can tunnel both pitches, or all three pitches in this case, and really um, really disguise it. And that's not really historically what Di Sclafani's been able to do with the changeup. His changeup's been awful historically, and he's had huge problems with lefties. So that hasn't totally translated yet this season. He's been good, and, and throwing the slider more is is allowing him to neutralize some of this left-handed power. But he's still not striking them out. 15% strikeout rate to lefties and 21% strikeout rate to righties. So even though this is my... Could you play some Disco tonight? Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, 8,700, not my favorite. 15% also kind of not my favorite. I'd rather play him than Blake Snell, for example. Um, almost exclusively. At half the ownership and basically the same projection. Um, and I think Di Sclafani is, is just better than Blake Snell. That said, I don't really want to play either of them, to be quite honest. Uh, I think the price tag is probably a little elevated in general, but this is Miami. They're bad against right-handed pitching. 85 WRC plus, 23.5% K rate, buck 35 ISO. They'll make a little bit of hard contact, but a lot of it's on the ground here to buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. So, uh, I don't want to deal with this. 135 ISO is no, just not intriguing, um, or or scary at all, right? So uh, you could play some some disco on the mound for sure. Uh, prefer mostly pitching here in, in this late game. I don't really want any of the Marlins, to be honest, and that's really why I kind of think it's okay to be playing Di Um Maybe a piece or two here from the from the Giants at, uh, at cheap price tags. Lamont Wade, Conforto, like I mentioned, but that's pretty much it uh, for this late game. Pitching only, I think. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for the breakdown. We may have kept us under an hour today. I don't know. Uh, let's go over stacks quickly. Cubs, Philly, um, not really interested terribly in offense here. Probably the Cubs if I had to choose. Um, not super interested in pitching either. I'm, I'm playing the wait-and-see game with Ranger. He's 62 or 6,300 or whatever he is. Um, 63 on DK. I think that's reasonable to consider at that price tag. Uh, bad matchup there. If, uh, if the Cubs get Nico back, though. Detroit and Washington. Um, Washington, sure. If you want, if you land on a couple of cheap Washington pieces, think that's okay. I don't want any Matt Boyd. 
Um, Jake Irvin, though, I think he's the pivot if you if you come off of Matt Boyd. Down in this range, I think he's playable um, because Detroit's, like, bad. Uh, Baltimore and Toronto, offense only here for me. I don't want pitching at all. Uh, I do like Baltimore a good bit. I like Toronto as well. They're going to be popular, but Baltimore less popular. And I want to go after Kikuchi. I don't, I think, you know, there's some smoke and mirror here. Um, Cleveland and the Mets. Yeah, you can play the Guardians tonight, I think, against Cookie. I'm not sure he's totally healthy, and I'm I'm certainly not playing him on the mound coming off of elbow inflammation. It's just not happening. Um, Cal Quantrill, you also can't play him. He's got a 11% swing strike rate, or a K rate. Mets, definitely, if I had to choose stacks, it'd be Cleveland between the two. Seattle and Atlanta, uh, sneaky offense here from Atlanta, I think. Um, yeah, maybe not sneaky at all, as a matter of fact. But uh, if you want to target some regression coming for both of these guys, I think that's okay. Maybe some Bryce Elder pieces in correlated Atlanta teams. Uh, that's going to be really off the board. I don't think many people are going to be playing that. You could play Bryce Miller, though, and I think that's okay. Very low ownership. He's expensive, and he's going to have a, a clunker at probably sooner than later, but, um, yeah, that's why I prefer Atlanta. Uh, okay, Colorado and Texas, uh, offense only here for me, and I think we might be able to get, play a little bit of the Rockies. Uh, Martin Perez, I'm not encouraged with his last couple outings, um, and I'm not really encouraged that he's not getting any ground balls, so I think that's that's stackable in short stacks with the Rockies, but they're, they're a playable price tags, I think. Oakland at Houston, you could play some Oakland here, to be quite honest, but you can also play B-Lock. I think this is probably where you land at 6,200 or something if you need to get down that cheap. You might not need to, but uh, Houston for sure, targeting Ken Waldachuk, they're going to be the most popular stack for pretty much everybody today. Uh, Casey and the White Sox, offense again, only here. Um, probably mostly KC for me. I prefer that and going after Michael Kopech, they're going to be popular also. You can stack the White Sox, sure. Uh, it's not terrible going after Grinky. Uh, it's it's hard sometimes, though. Dodgers, St. Louis, offense only. Maybe some Gonsolin, no Steven Matz. Uh, less enthused about the Cardinals because they put up 17 runs every day. That can't really persist, but who knows? Maybe it can. Um, Minnesota and the Angels, no Angels for me. I, li I, I like Joe Ryan here a good bit. Maybe a little bit of Detmers targeting uh, some... Pretty bad metrics from from the Twins overall, but I think you play some stacks there too. Boston, San Diego, Boston definitely uh, as leverage off of Blake Snell. I think he's terrible. Um, James Paxton, no thank you, and you can play some San Diego also. And just pitching in the in the late game here for me, I think. So I think that's where I stand. Uh, we'll see how it fleshes out over the rest of the day when we get um, ownership and and projections uploaded to the site. As you can kind of see over here, maybe you guys noticed a little bit, uh, I do have uh, the beginnings of something interesting over here uh, in a blue column. So we might have that uh, for you guys here soon. Uh, no promises, though, and we'll announce when, whenever we have any of that available. Um, that said, DK will be up. Um, so see how the ownership fleshes out throughout the rest of the day and embrace some of these these offenses here tonight uh, I think you can get different on the mound you don't have to eat Houston um, oh, don't fade them of course but uh, you don't have to just eat it you can play a bunch of different offenses here because a lot of these pitchers are very attackable so um, get different with it here tonight on a full 12 gamer I think we might see a good bit of offense so embrace the variance and good luck everybody